the truth, Lord, that, that is in that light. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. It is good to be with you. This exciting moment, uh, morning, because there's so much involved, and I thank you for, um, for being here today. We're going to step away from our study in Ephesians this morning for just a moment. We're still going to continue on in the message of what it is to be light. As this is a day of recognition and marks the beginning of uh, the newly elected people and so forth, I felt appropriate to repeat a message that I shared back in 2005 called Lights of the Realm. And if you feel cheated, then I never want you to complain about watching programs a second time on television. <laughs> Today you may remember more by what you see than what you hear. That is really the first lesson of the day. Because as leaders, and I'm talking now not exclusively to our newly elected elders or our existing elders, but um, I am speaking to them and I'm speaking to all of us as well because we are all servants of the living God. But as leaders, people remember more by what we do than by what we say. Keep that in mind, please. That people remember more of what we do than what we say. So this morning I'm going to ask that you would turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read to you from verses 1 through 13. This in particular is a description, if you will, of, from the Apostle Paul to Timothy as he's working within the framework. Remember, he's a young, new pastor, and he's talking to Timothy and instructing him, these are the qualifications of those who are going to be in leadership, particularly elders and deacons. He said, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, of elder, it is a fine work that he desires to do. An elder, then, must be above reproach, the husband of only one wife, temperate and prudent, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, meaning argumentative, but gentle, peaceable, and free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate and faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. If you are like the elders and myself, that is one public reading you'd rather not have read. It's a huge responsibility. Those of you that are here that have served in those capacities, you know it's a huge responsibility. Because when we build a reputation, it takes a long time to build one that says this person is solid, they are confident in their faith, they, they are of good character. It takes a long time to build those blocks of respect and dignity, and it takes an instant of a foolish decision to see that wall come crumbling down. It is one where we have to be on our toes every moment of every day. 
It is especially important for spiritual leaders of the church to be cognizant of this responsibility. But it is not exclusive to the leaders of the church. For all believers are to walk and to model Christ every moment of every day. So as I'm talking to our, our elders in particular, I'm talking to all of us together. What we're doing this morning is going to be very visual. If you're here in 2005, you remember probably pieces of that. We have communion we're going to take together. We have, and it's not the football season, so you can't say I have to get out and watch football. We're going to take as long as it takes, and it's not going to take as long as you think, but we have a lot of elements we want to deal with. There's a lot of symbolism today. We remember more by what we see many times than by what we hear. And so today you're going to have a little bit of both of that, okay? The first thing is, is that we serve the Christ, who is the King of Kings. All right? That's who we serve. We're talking today about what it is to be lights of the realm. If you have a king, you have a kingdom. You have a realm. And those within the kingdom are responsible to the king. A kingdom is not based on democracy or a republic. A king is based on, a kingdom is based on one person who makes the rules and enforces those through his subjects. Unfortunately, in the United States of America, we are so blessed by this republic, we're so blessed by this thing that we call free election. We think at times this is how we approach God. God is not our president. He is our king. We don't elect him. He elects us. And he can reject us. We are called to be obedient to the king. The king of kings, the scripture says, and the Lord of lords. There is only one king. And that king rules. And his rules are law. And he rules through the law of grace. Hallelujah. Every realm has a sovereign. Luke 23, 1 through 3, Jesus is standing in front of Pilate. And the whole of them got up and brought Jesus to Pilate. And they accused him saying, we found this misleading this man misleading our nation and forbidding, or forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, the king. Obviously, they were making up some stories about Jesus along the way. But Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered and said, it is as you say. There's a self-proclamation there. I am the king. Jesus does not deny it. He is our king. As a king, then, he has set up leaders to help govern the kingdom. And those leaders, we have read, are supposed to be people of good reputation. Love the law and live according to it. Respectable. Above reproach. That one's a hard one, folks. I don't know if you realize that. It's very hard to live above reproach. It's very hard to live above reproach. If you have children, younger or older, when they were younger, you know that there's moments that all of a sudden you want to explode on them. And there are people watching, even in your own home. How do we deal with those issues of the emotions and remain above reproach? That's because we have to get closer to God. So he fine-tunes our all, even our emotions. Elders, you are in a position of public position. People will watch you. Oddly enough, back um, my generation, there began to be a shift in the things of how the world looks at Christians and the church. I remember my parents, that when they applied for a job, the thing that would help them get a job is if they put down, I'm a member of a local church. Matter of fact, if they weren't a member, people would wonder what's wrong with them. They would scrutinize and say, um, you know, this is something that's culturally acceptable and expected, 
that you would be a person of respect and that you would be a God-fearing man or woman. Today, it's flipped. Don't bring God into this business. But they still watch those who proclaim to be Christians. They watch with scrutiny. And if you say that you are a spiritual leader of the church, that you have been chosen by your peers, elected to serve as the spiritual leaders and counselors of this congregation, it isn't just this congregation that's watching. They're watching with benevolence and love because they're friends. But when people out there in the world hear it, they watch with scrutiny. Are they really men of valor? Do they have respectability among their own people? Do they truly love the Lord their God and put him first in all things? Is he really their king? Or is he more of their helpmeet or Santa Claus when they get in trouble? Being an elder is a public position. But it's a called position as lights of the realm. Every realm has soldiers. 2 Timothy 2, 3, Jesus says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We are in a battle, aren't we? The scripture says that this world is not our home. We are strangers in a foreign land. We are aliens in this planet Earth if we are followers of Christ because we're part of His kingdom, not this kingdom, little k. Jesus said that we are to be in this world but not a part of it. That we are going to have to suffer but we're to suffer hardship for Him because as a soldier we must fight the good fight. And at the end of the day we want God to say to us, you did well, you fought well, well done. Not fought other people well, but fought the enemy of the kingdom well, which is Satan and his dominion. We are on a public exhibit, elders. Are we doing battle? Are swords different than it was in the days when they actually used weapons that were visible? Our sword is the word of God. The word of God can be used both defensively and offensively. offensively. Offensively is what God intended, that we would take ground back from the enemy that has been lost to God's kingdom. Defensively, that when someone attacks us, that we can defend our faith. And I'll say this with tongue in cheek, without calling the pastor and saying, hey, can you help me out here? <laughs> the elders are not alone. All believers are expected to know the Word of God and to be able to stand in defense of truth and to take ground for Christ that has been lost through the enemy's deceit and evil. This next part, guys, not all of you now, although all of us are involved, I ask these men, and this is where they're going to show if they truly love me or not, I'm going to ask you to come up here and take off your shoes and socks. This, I told them ahead of time, please have clean feet. <laughs> well, I didn't. I told them we were going to do this, but I didn't tell them we are going to have clean feet. You guys got them. This next part, I'll give them a chance to, to start doing this. And you've seen this model before, not only here, but in other places. It is, it is a humbling act on two, two counts here. Number one, for them to have to sit up here and take off their feet garments and look at you, it's kind of embarrassing. Imagine if you were up here and you're looking at everybody and they're going, well, this is kind of weird because we don't do this every day. This isn't like an ordinance God's given to the church. It's certainly an example he's given to the church. But the scripture says their feet look good too, guys. Thank you. The scripture says that we are to be humbled before God. Walk as a servant, not as a master. So this next point is the crushed, and that's the towel of the humble. Every man has, or every realm has servants. To get in this position, 
because, the, because of the world we live in, the government we live in in the United States or in Canada, many Western civilizations have governments now where people are, they move from like maybe serving on their local city council, then they become mayor, maybe a governor, then they go into the Senate or Congress. Some even become president or premiers. They move along this road to accomplish the utmost position of leadership. And sometimes we look at what it is to be an elder or a spiritual leader in the church and think to ourselves, wow, you've reached the epitome, the, the peak of, le- uh, of what it is to be a believer or a leader in a church. And the reality is, in Christ's kingdom, the greatest of these are the ones who serve. It's not the ones that get rolled up into the political ranks. Every realm has servants. In John 13, it says, Jesus got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. He poured water into the basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Understand what is being done here. Who did we just say Jesus was? The king. The king does not bow to his servants The king expects his servants to bow to him. And yet Jesus got up from his table. He wanted to demonstrate to his his disciples, his servants, what it means to serve. And so very briefly, these guys would be so happy, I put warm water in here. But what I would like to do very quickly, if I can, as I continue to talk, and forgive me for putting my back to you, but is to wash these men's feet. It's a public demonstration. Let me see how hot it is. No, it's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. David, you want to put your foot in there? Now, Dave Nelson is really saying to himself, guys, thanks for having clean feet. <laughs> Any other foot, please? Back in, the, back in the day, this was, this was quite a bit more uh, humbling because back in the day, number one, they didn't get an email and said, wash your feet. And number two, they traveled everywhere, most of them by foot. It was custom, it was custom in that uh, culture that the first thing you did was wash the feet of a person that came to your into your home. And in that culture, even today, even your enemy is a guest in your home. And you treat them with the same kind of hospitality and dignity. So they would come to the home. You can put your socks up and shoes back on if you like. They would, they would put uh, out the, the wash basin and towel. They would wash their feet from these travelers who travel with sandals in a hot, desert, arid environment. And then they have to wash off the crust. Now, these guys don't have any crust. At least, I haven't gotten any yet. (laughs) We got crust, but it's not on our feet. (laughs) Every other foot, please. So imagine now, the disciples are going to the Passover. And nobody has taken the time to think about this one important act. None of the disciples did. Matter of fact, the disciples were having an argument about who's the greatest in the kingdom. Rather than being a servant, they were trying to figure out who was the top dog. As a result of that, Jesus is listening to this discussion. He grabs the wash basin and towel. And then, and at that point is when the disciples become extremely embarrassed. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this. You know what? They were right. And the answer could have been, 
Jesus could have said, you're right. I shouldn't be. You should all be ashamed of yourselves. He didn't have to say it. They were already ashamed. But that's when he washed their feet. Remember, and Peter said, oh, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. Now he's talking about his soul. And then Peter, of course, being the man he is, says, well then, give me a bath. Wash all of me. Jesus was trying to make an important point. We are to be servants of others. Let me say it again, because it is not our nature. We are to serve people. We serve God by serving others. Folks, I can tell you, it's a struggle in me. It is not my nature to want to serve people. It must come from Christ. I was just thinking this morning, and so I'll give you a shame on me. I had noticed here a couple of our men, one of them's on the table, or on the table, one of the chairs up here. (laughs) Get off the table. Parks way out there. So that others can park near the front door. People that are aging, people that have health issues. And this morning I pulled up I was in a hurry, and I, I honestly thought to myself, I should go park over there, but I'm in a hurry. And I'm the pastor, so I should be able to park here. <laughs> That's not a servant attitude. That is not a servant attitude. There are days where, you know, you look. At, I, I go to some churches and visit, and... Uh, they have a sign up that says reserved for the pastor. I think, why don't I get one of them? And I think, what an arrogant jerk to think that as the pastor you should have your own parking space so other people have to walk further. Now, I don't, if anybody watches this as a fellow clergy, I'm not saying you're a jerk. <laughs> I'm just saying that my attitude has to change. And so does everybody else. If we're truly a servant, that means that we sacrifice to serve. The verse that continues in John 13 says, So when he, Jesus, had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you or to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. If then the Lord and teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who has sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Elders, we serve in a ministry of public humility, and that's how God wants us to serve. The next thing is that we serve under the authority and in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Comforter is represented in the oil of anointing. Every realm has counselors. We're told by Jesus, you wait, I'm going to send the counselor will come, the Comforter will come. And that is the Holy Spirit. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God. Listen to that verse again. He who established with us, establishes with us, or excuse me, he who establishes us with you in Christ is God. It is God who establishes us. For you guys who are serving as elder, it is God's desire, and he has put you in this position. You cannot serve, and I cannot serve, without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And the oil has always been emblematic and represents the Holy Spirit. So David, I anoint you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
John, I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jim, welcome back to the elder group. I anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Greg, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And David, I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's nothing magical or mystical about the oil. It is oil, olive oil. But it represents someone who is a mystery, and that is the Holy Spirit. And we cannot serve without the Spirit's anointing and empowerment. Also in a kingdom, there is the committed. There is an oath of allegiance. Every realm has a swear-in ceremony, if you will. Mark 12, 30-31 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Notice how Jesus says that. Now, I'm not an English dude, and my wife will tell you grammatic grammar and stuff is not my cup of tea. But listen to how this is worded. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is, singular, no other commandment greater than these, plural. Now that doesn't make grammar, grammatical sense, does it? You don't use a singular and a plural together. But Jesus did because he wanted us to understand they are tied together. They are important. You can't say that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but you don't love others very well. You can't do that. We serve God by serving others. So I'm going to ask the elders to take a public oath, if you would, a pledge to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would stand, please. I will read the words and just ask that you would repeat them. I, a servant of my King Jesus, pledge my sacrifice to promote His sovereignty. Pledge my honor to demonstrate his transforming power. Pledge my loyalty to model his faithfulness. Pledge my sword, God's word, to instruct and defend his truth. Pledge my wash basin and towel to live humbly and in, or to live humility and service. I pledge to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. And I pledge to love others as I would love myself. You may be seated. Thank you, gentlemen. Also in the realm, a kingdom there is the commission. A commission is when you separate someone or something unto service. And every realm has a sending for service. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, is the commission of all believers. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This morning we're going to do a unique public commission for the elders. The Scripture says that the Bible is considered the sword of the Spirit, a two-edged sword that can cut right down to the bone and marrow of everyone's soul. As a light of the realm, we are to master how that weapon is used. We are to understand that the enemy cannot defeat us 
if we can use the sword effectively. And that's true for all of us. If you're like me, you have a number of Bibles in your home. Some sit on a shelf, some are worn out, some look brand new, even though they've got dust on them. The sword is what God has given us as a weapon to take back that which was lost because Satan has dev is devouring God's children and to defend the faith when people attack and say it isn't real. So this sword represents the Word of God in physical form. And what I'm going to do with this is what you've seen in many movies of kingdoms. Is I'm going to knight, in this case we're going to call light, these men as lights of the realm. Gentlemen, there is the call. And we're going to ask you to arise to action in a moment. But let me just take a moment to do this, and I promise not to nick your ears. <laughs> David, I light you as a light of the realm in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John, I light you as a light of the realm in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jim, I guess I relight you because you have been here before, and I do so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Greg, I light you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. David, I light you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit whom we serve. And so once that is done, there is the call to arise to action. You have been redeemed by Christ Jesus to remind you he is king. So have you. You have the title of elder to remind you of your calling. We all have the title of Christian to remind us of who we serve. You have the basin and the towel to remind you that you are a servant that should serve others, as do we all. You have the oil to remind you of your power to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have your sword, the Word of God, to remind you of your oath, as do we all. And you have this congregation to remind you of your privilege and responsibility. Therefore, arise and take action. Serve the King. Care for His subjects as lights of the realm. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Lord, yes, it's some dramatic what we did today, but it was with the, a point of understanding and seeing physically the elements of our responsibility to serve as servants of Jesus Christ. Be, Lord Jesus, with David and John and Jim Greg and Dave, myself, as we serve as elders, that we walk wisely, that we step back when we think our egos or, or our experience should come forth before we take time to pray and to seek you about decisions. Be with this congregation that we would serve as lights of the realm together. We were once in darkness, but now we are light of the Lord. Let us live as lights of the realm in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for you are good and use us for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue. I, I do want to show this because I have this for our men. We're giving things of example this morning. They got a little letter opener that is a sword uh, and that is to represent uh, the sword of the Lord, the word of God. And make sure you men grab that before you go today. They're going to start this morning, 
after this message by serving you communion. We're going to eat at the table of the Lord together. And we're going to do it in a unique fashion. Uh, we've done this a couple of times before. But they will serve you. But they're going to bring both the bread and the cup to you at the same time. We're going to be singing a song uh, led by the worship team as the elements are being passed. And I'm going to ask that you would wait until everyone is served, and upon my instruction, we will eat and drink together. Now, elders, the worship team haven't had communion yet this morning, as we normally have done, so make sure you serve them as well, okay? And we have enough, Greg, that you can go back to the guitar if you like. Okay, so we're going to move into communion. The table of the Lord. What does it represent? The body of Christ, which was broken for us, so that we might know what it is to have a Savior, the blood of Christ that was shed for us, that we might know what it is to be saved. And Jesus gave it to us as an ordinance to the church. God did the Father and said, This do in remembrance of me. Be reminded. We're going to have a word of prayer again. In that time of prayer, you and I need to examine ourselves before we take communion. I always want to give this warning because the scripture says, examine yourselves before you take the elements. Because if you or I take the elements in an unworthy fashion, if we don't deal with those things that God prompts us to deal with, then we are as guilty as the person that called for the death of Christ. And for this reason, the scripture says some of you get sick and some of you even die. We don't want that. So let's take a few moments of silence to examine ourselves. I'm going to ask Mary Jo just to play during our silent prayer. Our men will get ready to serve the elements. And then uh, when we start singing, you can look up again, and these folks will be passing out the elements to you as our worship team leads us together in music. Father God, the communion table is a wonderful thing. It's filled with anticipation and excitement and celebration of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, our King. Yet it also, Lord, is somber in that we are to come to it not as a religious institution kind of thing, but rather, Father, to examine ourselves, make sure we're right with God this morning the way you intend. So, Spirit, I pray you'll speak into our lives, each one of us, at this very moment. Now, if there's anything that needs to be dealt with, that we will confess it to you, knowing that you will forgive us and then not go back to that and receive together the elements of the Lord's table. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please just take a few moments to pray silently as the piano plays.